right now what I typically do is I, I introduce a speaker and hand over, but I always say I'm terrible at introducing speakers. So <laughs> no problem. I think, Rita, I, I let you introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm just uh, want to say that I'm very glad to have you here and I'm very glad to have you talking about my two favorite topics, which is evolution and and uh, colonial nesting birds. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. And, thank you. Uh, thank looking you so forward much. to. It. So thank I think you, you can so go much. ahead and share and and just take okay. over, and I will shut up and and mute. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, well, I guess first I need to apologize to everyone because my camera is not working for some reason. I have no idea why. It has been working the whole afternoon and. Uh, yeah, try to reboot and everything, but my camera is not working. But of course, the you're here to see the talk and not to see my face. So I, I think that is not going to be a problem. Um, so yes, just a brief introduction. I am um, I am a biologist. Uh, I am a researcher. I do research on mostly on the topics of um, of cooperation and sociality. <clears throat> I'm based at the University of Porto at uh, CBU, which is a research center. Uh, in biodiversity at the University of Porto, and I'm also um, a honorary research associate at the Fitzpatrick Institute at the University of, of Cape Town. And this talk is it's a, a cent, uh, mostly around um, cooperation uh, in the social weavers, a little bit about conflict as well, that is the, the other side of uh, living in, in societies. Um, I will be telling you, this is a long term project, we have been working on these birds for, um, well, uh, me for um, 20 years, more than 20 years, actually, with, with some interruptions, and now this, the project has been going for 12 years non-stop, so these are the results of um, our long term work. And because the the talk is, is about the social weavers, but a lot about cooperation, I just wanted to start by giving you um, a little um, introduction to the topic of um, of cooperation, why it is so so interesting to to study cooperation. And so to start, we, we know that um, cooperation is, is really widespread in nature. It's, uh, it occurs from um, unicellular organisms uh, across all levels of uh, biological organization, actually, even in molecules, but um, in many species. And of course, um, um, as humans, we are chief uh, cooperators and most of our achievements are based on, on cooperative efforts. And uh, cooperation also serves different purposes. So um, individuals will, will cooperate in order to obtain food, to build shelter, to um, fight or, or protect themselves from predators uh, and so on. But Cooperation is, is um, very interesting in that it uh, brings benefits to the group, but it's costly to the individuals. So when individuals come together to, to, co to achieve some, some task, uh, the whole group is going to benefit, but the cost is borne by, by each individual. So I, I, I give you here this example of um, a Cape Cobra uh, on a sociable weaver nest. Cape Cobras are uh, big predators of, of sociable weavers, uh, the, the nestlings and eggs in particular. And if enough sociable weavers get together, they might uh, manage to, to mop the snake successfully I think it's from, from their nest. But uh, each individual sociable weaver that is going to participate in that effort is incurring a cost and uh, it can be killed by, by the snake. So, there, so how much should an individual contribute to, to a cooperative uh, effort? This is a dilemma that has been identified for as long as uh, as man is thinking about these things. Um, but in uh, in 1968, there is a, a landmark uh, paper in, in science that called these um, this problems of how much you invest in a communal um, task or a communal good, the tragedy of the commons. This was Garrett Hardin's um, paper in, in, in science. And he, he was um, drawing the attention to the problem that uh, human societies uh, face. Uh, especially with the population increasing, that we, we uh, rely on communal resources, but we all want to take the most of, of those um, 
out of those resources. So one of the examples is, is a pasture where um, different cattle owners have access to a communal pasture. It is in the interest of each one of them to put as many cattle on the pasture as um, as as they can. But this, of course, has a cost for the, the communal pasture in that the too, mu too much cattle will lead to overgrazing to the collapse of this, this pasture and then none of the cattle will, will be able to, to feed. So, um, so this is a this dilemma means that there is a cost in cooperation, uh, whether it is the cost of what you're actually, the effort and the energy you're putting into it, or, or the cost of what you are losing by being cooperative. Uh, but all in all, cooperation has a cost. And so for cooperation to evolve, the benefits need to be higher than the costs, uh, put simply. And um, cooperation, as I say at the beginning, it's uh, it's extremely common. We find it uh, at all. Uh, we find it in, in nature across a huge diversity of species. So there have to be um, uh, there has to be benefits, and we we are interested in understanding what are these these benefits and, and how they overcome these costs. So one very successful explanation for. Um, why cooperation has evolved and how it is maintained and why it is stable is the kin selection hypothesis. And this is based on the fact that we share uh, genes with our close relatives. So we share about 50% of our uh, genes with, with our siblings, with our parents and our offspring. And uh, so if we are helping other close relatives to reproduce this in, in is almost uh, si uh, similar to reproducing ourselves. Um, so this has been, as I say, a very successful explanation for co cooperation, why cooperation has evolved, because the, a lot of um, cooperation takes place in family groups. So uh, there are very well known examples I and mean, all the, the social um, insects, uh, they, they have a very uh, structured uh, genetic, uh, very, they live, live in close uh, family groups because of their genetics, they're actually even more related than, than full siblings uh, are. Uh, but there's a, a whole variety of, of examples uh, in meerkats, birds, primates. There's uh, um, many uh, cooperative interactions do take place within family groups. And the, the little equation I, I put here was um, devised by um, a very important scientist, Bill Hamilton, who did the, the mathematics of, um, of this. And he, he realized that if the relatedness times the, the benefit of cooperation is higher than the cost, then cooperation can evolve. So it's, it, this, it provides us a basis to actually quantify what is going on here. But we know that kin selection can't explain everything because cooperation is frequent among non-kin, uh, even among uh, different uh, species. And I mean, as humans, again, we are very good at, uh, at helping people we've never met uh, before. So there have to be some other types of explanations, and uh, these are what we call direct benefits. So it means that by helping others, individuals are also uh, gaining something. And um, this can be um, a byproduct um, or a consequence of a self-serving behavior. So I put here this photo of a meerkat uh, watching for predators. Meerkats will, will climb, um, trees, termite mounds, or uh, to, to, to be on an elevated path. And from there, they can watch for predators. So they will be very, if, if they see a, a predator, um, a raptor, for example, they will produce an alarm call and all the other uh, group members, all the other meerkats in, in the group will flee for cover. But the this meerkat is the one to first see what is going on so he's actually in the safest position even though he seems to even though he's exposed he is the one who sees the danger first um, then the other type of direct benefits is what we obtain from reciprocity um, as, and, and being chosen because we've helped as as uh, 
and being the recipient of help because we've helped someone. So a very simple uh, example is um, allo grooming or allo preening in birds, where um, you know, you, you, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, and it's a very, very simple mechanism that has been shown to, to occur in, in nature. But there are more sophisticated uh, ways um, in which individuals reciprocate. And uh, a general term for that is partner choice. So it means that I will choose to, to help someone that I, has helped me before or someone that I have seen helping others. Um, and there's various examples on this, but I will get back to this just a little bit later. Um, and so it is against this uh, background of trying to understand uh, the costs and benefits of cooperating that we have been work doing our work on the, on the sociable weavers, the bird that you see here on this slide. Um, and before I continue, I just wanted to say that this is by no means uh, work done by myself alone. It's a, a big group effort and has been uh, along the years. There have been uh, numerous people working on the project. Um, I wanted to acknowledge my main collaborator, Claire Dutrelon, who runs the project uh, with me, and uh, a small army of uh, field assistants, graduate students, postdocs, and, and collaborators that uh, uh, do the work every year and um, analyze the data, contribute with, with ideas and in numerous ways. So back to the, the sociable weaver, this is the sociable weaver nest, I, I guess uh, most of you are familiar with this um, with these birds, with these impressive nests, they build these uh, large thatched uh, structures, usually on acacia trees. Uh, they're associated with the, the Kalahari ecosystem. And then within each colony, you have individual chambers. You see here the, the darker dots are the individual chambers. They are used by um, a breeding pair with, uh, with its helpers. So usually it's uh, um, a breeding pair and uh, their offspring and uh, sometimes other relatives. When it's a big group, uh, they will occupy more than one chamber. And uh, what we also know is that the, they tend to uh, to be in extended family groups in, in so that in, in this area of the colony or over here, you will find that individuals are more related than they are to the ones uh, on, on that other side of the colony. So, and then of course, the, the whole colony also has its own um, uh, identity. They, they fly and forage uh, together. So it's, you have different levels of social organization within these um, colonies in, in, in many ways similar to traditional human societies. The nests are used for roosting, of course, to raise the, the chicks, and they will also be used for um, to seek shelter from predators. Uh, Gabar gossox, uh, for example, would uh, will drive the birds back, uh, flying back into their nests. They are uh, also used by a number of, of other species. Uh, actually uh, a high number of species, but uh, the most uh, important ones are the Cape Cobras and boom slugs that uh, feed on the sociable weaver eggs and, and chicks, and the pygmy falcon, which can only breed, can only nest in association with the sociable weaver. So he's an obligate um, uh, host of, uh, sorry, not host, guest of the, the, the sociable weavers. The sociable weavers are excellent to, to study cooperation because of uh, they are a highly cooperative species in, in many ways. So they have a cooperative nest building. Their impressive nest mass is built uh, cooperatively by, by several. It's the result of the effort of, uh, of uh, several birds. Most of the birds in the colony contribute to that. They are cooperative breeders with help, helpers at the nest. This means that the breeding pair is assisted by non-breeding helpers, so uh, adult birds, uh, sexually mature, that do not reproduce and instead help uh, bringing food and looking after the, the, the chicks uh, of, of the, the breeding pair of that nest. They will also cooperate to mob predators and they have uh, a cooperative uh, vigilance uh, system as well in, in which birds uh, avoid, um, give uh, alarm calls to, to warn others of uh, danger. 
This is a photo of our study site at uh, Benfontein Nature Reserve. It's just outside Kimberley uh, in the Northern Cape. You can see the, on the map um, here more or less where we are. And we, we have been, so I actually did my PhD on, on these birds and that was um, almost uh, 20 years ago. Uh, then I've worked on other things, but you know, I went back in 2008 and uh, now for the last uh, 12 years we have, um, we have non-continuous data um, on reproduction and um, I, will, I will give a little bit of the detail of the data that we are collecting. We monitor 15 colonies at Benfontein, uh, and this means that we follow more than 500 uh, birds which are all individually marked. So to mark all these birds individually, we catch um, all the, the, the resident birds in, in all our study colonies once a year before the breeding season. This is what you see, or what you see here on the left um, is uh, you see the, the mist nets that we place around the, the trees where the colonies are. We set up the, the nets before dawn, then we flush the birds into the into the nests, into the nets, and uh, so we have a very high uh, success rate with these captures, and usually most of the, the resident birds um, are caught like this. So we can track uh, movement between colonies. We can, if we have uh, immigrants, we can ring them. Uh, then we we need a. Uh, uh, group a good uh, team to process all the birds because all the birds uh, from the colony fall into the nets at the same time so to extract the, the birds and then process them quickly to uh, release them as, as, as quickly as possible there's always a big group of people helping and they help with the various tasks which are taking um, a blood sample so we get a blood sample from each individual so that we can sex them because they are sexually monomorphic, which means that we cannot tell the sexes apart um, in the field, they look alike. So we do molecular sexing. And we also um, analyze their genotype. So in order to know the relatedness among them, we know how some of, because we have been doing this work for a long time, we know some of the, uh, for many of the individuals now, um, we have their pedigree. Uh, but uh, we always have immigrants and we always have doubts, so we do uh, genetic analysis to have the relatedness among the, the individuals. We measure them, weigh them, and each individual is marked with a unique color combination you see here, uh, so that we can uh, identify them visually, but um, what you see here, the yellow uh, ring is a uh, contains a pit tag, uh, the same ones that people use to mark pets. And um, later in the talk, I will explain uh, what we are using this for. During the breeding season, we do detailed work um, on the whole breeding activity. We monitor breeding in, um, in detail, meaning that we record the uh, the activity at each nest. So these uh, colonies uh, are checked, all the chambers in a colony are checked every three days to detect initiation of uh, new clutches. Um, then when the chicks are due to hatch, we we go there to mark the hatching date, we measure the chicks when they are um, and ring them when they are nine days old. We go back and coloring them and weigh them and measure them before they fledge. Um, and uh, with this, we, we are, and then we record the, um, with video cameras, which is what we are doing here under the photo on the, the right, we are setting up video cameras to record the nest attendance behavior. And through the colorings of the birds, we can know uh, who are the, the adults that are feeding at each nest. Uh, so we have the, the group size, as I said, they are cooperative breeders, so we have helpers at the nest and like this we can tell how many helpers there are um, at the nest and uh, who these, these helpers are. And uh, we also use video cameras to record um, the individual uh, investment in other cooperative tasks like the, the nest building, vigilance. Uh, again, 
it's a uh, it's, it's a big team of people to to do all of these and not just because of the field work but because then it's a lot of work to process all the data that we collect and to analyze the data and do the, the statistical analysis and and so that in the end we have results from our research but uh, with all of this research what have we found so this is what i'm going to tell you now i will start with the cooperative breeding which is what um, we have worked on uh, most it's also because it's one of the easiest things to study it's all all happens at at the nest other behaviors are a little bit trickier although we are getting there as well uh, so with cooperative breeding we first had a, an intriguing question we wanted to to ask which is why do these birds that are helping, why they are uh, adults and so, uh, sexually mature birds, why aren't they breeding independently? So this means that they are delaying their breeding dispersal. Uh, and, and why is that? And uh, someone had proposed that uh, these birds don't breed because there are some, there's some form of ecological constraints. Uh, so it could be something that prevents the birds from breeding. So it could be lack of territories, lack of mates. Um, it could be lack of food. And um, the sociable weavers are colonial and they couldn't, they, they couldn't have a lack of territories because they can always add on to their... Um, communal uh, nest masses but um, in this uh, in this Kalahari ecosystem where they live the the conditions are highly variable so you have um, the typical years will won't have much rain uh, you know there's the, it's even in summer things can stay relatively dry um, here um, it, this is a, a bad year and we can actually see that there's patches of bare um, sand that are, are uh, appearing so in, in a year like this there aren't many insects around uh, the, the, the grass hasn't really germinated there's not a lot of seed left whereas in good years um, with good rains, everything gets green. You have lots of insects. Uh, you have the, the lots of uh, plant um, production, lots of seeds. So very good conditions. So we thought maybe this is what is driving the uh, this this behavior of delaying dispersal is and the poor conditions. It might be too costly to to reproduce uh, independently, especially for the younger, less experienced birds. Um, and in under these conditions, it would make more sense to just um, uh, help instead of, of breeding. So we did uh, a food supplementation experiment We half of our colonies uh, receive uh, a food supplement every day. So we would go to the colonies and just spread bird seed uh, uh, on, on the ground. And the, the other half of the colonies, we would visit them every day as well, but they didn't receive any, any extra food. And we obtained the results that we were hoping to, to get. So in the, the graph on the left is for the proportion of breeders in, the, in our population. And in the food supplemented colonies, which is the, the, here on, on, on the right, uh, more birds were, were breeding. Whereas for uh, the number of helpers, which is the graph on the right, um, it, uh, it's decreased in the food supplemented colonies. So as we were expecting, the giving food to, the, to these birds increased the independent uh, breeding and decreased helping. So this was a simple experiment with, with the good straightforward answers, which was, was great. It's not always like this, definitely not. Um, but we were happy that we had some sort of um, understanding of uh, the, the decisions that go into, into breeding independently and, and into helping. Uh, but uh, then we still wanted to understand why helping, what, what are the benefits, what do they gain from helping, since uh, still it's, it's energetically costly, they are uh, incurring predation risk while moving backwards and forth to find food for, for the chicks, uh, so, so there have to be some benefits, what are the benefits? The, the first thing we wanted to look at was this kin selection hypothesis, that they, they help because they are helping their close kin, and um, in doing so, they are contributing to spread their own genes in the population, although indirectly and not directly as you do through reproduction. Uh, 
So we had to see how related these helpers were to the breeders or the chicks that they were helping to, to raise. And what you see here, you have the, the red is for females and the blue is for males. And here, these two bars on the left, they tell us that the majority of the helpers in our population are full siblings of the, the chicks that they are uh, raising we or that, that they are helping to raise we also have um, half sibs uh, we also have more distant relatives like uncles and uh, even more uh, distant relatives or, or distant um, or unrelated birds but what this tells us is that the these helpers are essentially uh, helping their parents to raise their their brothers and, and sisters um, but um, uh, so this, it, it's, it's good, it's in agreement with this kin selection hypothesis, but do they actually, does their help actually does something meaningful? Are they uh, helping, are they increasing the reproductive output of their parents or the, the, the survival of their parents? And the, the general answer is yes, although it's not, um, not under all conditions, so the effect is not super strong, but we do find under some conditions that uh, having helpers is, is beneficial. So we found, for example, that uh, uh, the helpers are, are associated with higher fledging mass when rainfall is low. And this is important because when rainfall is low, there is less food available. So it's the, the chicks should be fledging um, uh, with lighter mass. And the, the chicks raised by pairs alone do fledge with the um, with the lower uh, body mass. But if if there are helpers, uh, on average, there's an increase in about one gram. Which for these small um, chicks, it's actually meaningful. And we know that uh, fledging mass is is important for the post fledging survival. We also found that the the presence of helpers improves uh, fledging success in uh, in larger colonies, and this is important. So not uh, not across uh, all colony sizes, specifically in larger colonies. And this is important because in larger colonies, reproductive success is usually lower. Usually in larger colonies, there is, um, so there are more birds, so there is more um, competition for resources and for food uh, that gets depleted uh, immediately around the colony and studies in other species. We didn't do this for the sociable weavers, but we have information from other colonial species that the birds need to travel further away uh, to find food when they are uh, breeding in in larger colonies. So the presence of helpers again here uh, in these larger colonies is important. Um, then more recently, we also looked at the, the effect of helpers um, and uh, uh, in relation to, to, to temperature. This was work done by a postdoc that is currently working with us, Pietro D'Amelio. And um, we wanted to, to look at uh, the effect of temperature on reproductive um, uh, success. And uh, because we, we expect uh, that uh, and the, the current um, global warming scenario, we know that uh, the, the, the intensity of um, hot spells and droughts is, is, is expected to increase. And we wanted to know, do the social species, are, are, are they better equipped because of the, the presence of helpers to cope with these negative effects of heat um, and drought or um, or, or, or not, or, or can't they do anything? And what you see in this graph uh, is very interesting. We see that, so in, in green and in blue, you have uh, birds breeding with helpers, and this is the fledging probability. So here you see that for the, the green line, which is uh, groups of six, so parents breeding with four helpers, and in the blue line, which is parents breeding with two helpers, a group of four, the, the fledging probability is higher than for the red line, which is the parents breeding by themselves. Uh, so two parents alone. But this effect is only detectable up to a certain temperature. When the temperatures are very high, the, everyone has uh, poor breeding success. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have helpers or not, they, they just can't help. The breeding success goes down for everyone. So this is actually something that uh, we are finding uh, in um, in social species and cooperative breeders uh, in particular. We were really expecting, because of previous results such as, such as the one that I've just shown you above, we were uh, hoping that uh, 
cooperative breeders would be better um, equipped or at least to some extent more protected from the detrimental effects of climate change, but it seems that they are not. And uh, I know that Susie Cunningham will be talking in this um, seminar series uh, next week. So I really recommend that you watch her seminar because she will be talking about the effects of heat on, on birds and their, their work is really super interesting. Um, but, uh, okay, in spite of all of these, we, we do find that the helpers improve reproductive output under some conditions, uh, at least, or at least they improve the condition of the, uh, the, the chicks. Um, and we also wanted to know whether they are beneficial for the parents in other ways. Uh, we found that yes, they are. Otherwise, um, means that the helpers, um, the, the, the parents work less when they have uh, helpers because the helpers contribute to, to feed the chicks. So the, what you see in this graph on the left is the feeding rates of uh, parents in pairs, so parents alone, and here parents in groups. And you see that when the, the parents um, are breeding in groups, they feed less. So the, because the, the, the work is shared, they don't have to work as hard. And we have a similar effect to the one reported here for uh, uh, brooding, uh, so keeping the, the, the young chicks warm. Sanitation, the, the helpers help to remove the fecal sacs from, from the nest, and they also help to build with nest building, so or maintenance, because the nests are built, but with the nest uh, maintenance. Uh, and all of this uh, is translated into improved breeding, um, improved survival, especially for the, the females. So the breeding females, they have higher survival when they have helpers, especially the young and less experienced females. Um, the, the, these graphs are a bit complex and I won't go into that, but what they tell us is that uh, the younger females uh, experience uh, um, higher survival when they have helpers. This effect is not as strong later in in life. Uh, and for males, we don't find that. Actually, if for males, we find the, the opposite, uh, which might be due to the competition with, with helpers and, and social stress of being in a, in a larger group. Um, but so to, to sum up this part, the helpers are closely related to the breeders. They improve the breeding success under some conditions at least. Uh, they allow the breeders to work less when caring for the brood, which uh, allows them to save energy. Um, and the females uh, appear to have improved survival when they are assisted by helpers. But the, this is not, uh, so we, we can take uh, some conclusions from here, but uh, this is still work to be continued because what we have done is, look, is to look at reproductive success and survival in some years. But when we are interested in, in the evolution of a behavior, we want to understand what it happens to an individual uh, who, the, adopts that behavior for, for most of its life, or if it is early in life, what are the consequences for later in life? So we, we want to understand the fitness um, uh, benefits in terms of lifetime reproductive success and also the fitness costs. So the individuals that dedicate more time to, to helping uh, at the nest, uh, at the end of their lives, will they leave more or less descendancy? Uh, and for this, we need to include direct uh, descendants and also non-descendant uh, um, non kin, so their nephews uh, um, and so on. So uh, this is, as you can imagine, a lot of um, work and takes a long time It's uh, to, to get to lifetime reproductive success of the individuals. So it's uh, we're getting there, but it's still, it's still work to be continued. But as I said earlier in my talk, Kin selection is only part of the, the explanation for um, uh, because uh, not um, because we have cooperation among non kin and uh, because groups are also often composed of kin and non kin, so you will have uh, kin and non kin interacting and helping each other in in some in, in many species. Uh, so we need to understand. Um, uh, what is what is going on with these non-kin groups or mixed uh, kin and non-kin groups 
and uh, this is the work that we have started to do now um, and we are focusing uh, mainly on this um, question of whether more cooperative individuals are preferred um, so not just preferred as uh, in the in the baboon example above where you know the allo grooming you scratch my back I scratch yours but also uh, in a more complex way of whether more cooperative individuals will be preferred as uh, sexual partners or social partners and I think for us humans this makes intuitive sense if we are going to associate with someone for um, uh, to achieve a task or even uh, to have children with we uh, most of us will prefer to to choose someone who is generous uh, cooperative uh, hardworking um, and and there is uh, empirical uh, support for, for this idea coming from from humans studies in humans but also in fascinating examples in other systems like uh, the, the the fish uh, that i that in this photo is the a, a cleaner client uh, system uh, from tropical coral reefs uh, where the the cleaners uh, clean the these clients uh, but they from parasites but they sometimes take a bit of the the, the client mucus which is actually their preferred um, food and uh, so the the clients watch which are the most cooperative cleaners so the ones who take more parasites and less mucus to choose with who they're going to, to associate. And uh, there are similar examples of, um, so, so it, it's an example of, of partner choice, who you're going to choose as your partner in this, in this interaction. And uh, there are fascinating examples in, in other groups, uh, in dwarf mongooses work then in, in South Africa, their uh, similar um, uh, work, the, uh, of showing the importance of partner choice in uh, vampire bats uh, and even in um, in nitrogen fixing bacteria and uh, and the plants they associate with they've also shown uh, a choice on the part of the the plant uh, for the more cooperative uh, bacteria so so uh, compelling evidence in favor of the role of partner choice for um, to explain the, the evolution and, and maintenance of, of cooperation but um, what we don't know is how this translates in fitness at the end of an individual's lifetime so what we are seeing is just something uh, is it something that really has consequences for an individual uh, fitness so for the individual's probability of surviving and reproducing and leaving more um, descendants at the end of its life or is it just something that we observe but doesn't really have isn't really of much consequence to uh, and this uh, makes a difference because uh, in evolutionary terms, we need to do the fitness consequences. Otherwise, uh, we, we can't see how the behavior will evolve. Uh, so in the sociable weavers, we are tackling this, um, this question now, uh, breaking it down into different uh, uh, sub questions, which we're all very excited to be um, starting to, to work on. Uh, so one of these sub questions that we, we have to understand is what makes cooperation reliable? Is cooperation reliable? And why is it reliable? And so by this, I mean, if you are going to choose to associate with, with an individual, you need to know that uh, either that individual is helping because it's a, a very good quality individuals so all the work that is going into this helping behavior uh, whatever that that might be um, if it is costly it demands energy is it because it's individuals of better quality or that are in better condition that are better able to to do this behavior so if i choose this individual i'm getting a good quality partner for whatever interaction um, we're going to have or uh, is it because the cooperative behavior is consistent? So with the sociable weavers, because they have these different behaviors, the nest building, the helping at the nest, the predator mobbing, vigilance, we are interested in understanding whether an individual that is a better builder, uh, is it also a better helper at the nest? Is it also better at mobbing and uh, better at detecting predators and providing 
um, warnings to the to the group or in other words is this um, propensity to cooperate uh, a personality trait from this uh, individual so uh, and that means that in different circumstances in different contexts some individuals will always have, uh, have higher tendency to cooperate and others will always have less so we still don't know we are still uh, we are still collecting the the data to to find out but some sort of um, reliability um, should should exist there uh, and to, to collect all these data on the, these different behaviors we rely a lot on on video uh, i mean we rely essentially on on video recordings some direct observations as well and it's all very time consuming to collect those uh, to analyze those uh, those video recordings so i've been extremely lucky to have um, a phd student andre ferreira on the photo down here who is um, a real uh, technology geek <laughs> in, in the absolute good sense. And he has developed a method to, uh, that uses artificial intelligence to identify individuals based on the pattern of the, the feather pattern on, on the back. And um, uh, so the, the method was developed on these um, when the birds come to these feeders, but we are now using it to uh, automatically analyze videos of uh, helping at the nest so with the help of uh, Liliana which is on the photo up there um, uh, Liliana is, is, is quite advanced into and uh, into the developing this method and we are starting to use it already um, uh, to in, in our video analysis we are trying to uh, now to develop that to use uh, in for nest building um, and uh, and vigilance as well and mobbing is um, is the most challenging one because the birds come uh, in in these different behaviors uh, it's more stereotypical the way the, the birds uh, are caught by the camera, whereas with predator mobbing, they are in all sorts of different um, uh, positions. So it's it's a bit more challenging, but uh, we still hope we'll get there. Uh, then we want to understand what are the benefits of being chosen. So uh, if more cooperative individuals are preferred, does that and so chosen as, as partners for, for these um, associations, what does this mean? Uh, Specifically, does, does this mean that um, if they are chosen, uh, preferentially chosen as sexual partners, they will be uh, they will have increased mating success and increased reproductive success, or um, does it mean that uh, if they're chosen as social partners, they are they have less chances of of being alone or being in a smaller group, for example, when foraging, which we know it's important to be in in a larger group for predator protection, or, or during roosting, uh, it gets very cold in the Kalahari uh, in winter. Uh, and the nights can go, the, the temperatures can drop below zero. So to have to be um, part of a, a group, so to have your social network and uh, and be uh, always um, in a group for for roosting keeps you warmer. It's it's important, and uh, to to quantify uh, this um, this social associations and see who the birds you know, who their uh, social group is, we use these p tags that I mentioned um, earlier. And uh, when the birds come to, we have some feeders uh, in our study uh, area, and um, that we only switch on every few days. And um, when the birds come to the the feeders we can record the feeding associations, we can know who is feeding with whom. And uh, so this gives us an indication of the, the social network of these, uh, of these birds. Uh, the last question is, do better helpers make better partners? So if, if I choose to associate with a bird because it's a better helper, what am I getting from that? It's a better partner? Is it a more um, hardworking individual? And what are the benefits for me? Uh, does this mean that I will have increased reproductive uh, success or improved health or higher survival? So these are all things that we are starting to, to quantify. But... Um, that was all about cooperation, and uh, as indicated in the title of my talk, there's the other side of, of living in societies, which is the, the conflict that arises because of uh, uh, 
conflicts in, uh, of interest in access to things like food, mates, um, social status as well, because that can also provide access to, to mates or to foods and, and other resources. And um, I think a question that we that is interesting to ask here is: uh, uh, Are there factors that uh, influence this balance between cooperation and, and conflict? And can can we understand what are these these factors that uh, um, tip uh, make the balance tip more towards cooperation or more towards conflict? So this is the the last part of my talk. We haven't done as, as much work on the conflict, but there are some things that I, I thought would be interesting to share. Um, just to start, the, the sociable weavers, like other the animals, they they have um, they have dominance hierarchies in in the colonies, and uh, to avoid um, continuous fighting over who to show who is um, who is dominant over whom, they have ritualized behaviors and they have and their dominance hierarchy is signaled by the the black bib uh, that you see here and on the photo on the right you see um, an individual with the, a large bib uh, and the small bib and the the large bib individual is uh, usually dominant over the, the small big ones. Uh, so this is, as I say, it's not only in sociable weavers, there's actually, there was a lot of work on this um, on these bibs and badges of status, as they are called, in um, European sparrows, the, the house sparrow, uh, and there's there in, in plenty of, of other species. So this, this, um, this and, and ritualized behaviors like what you have here, this bird is, uh, this bird crouches a little in, the, in relation to the other one. They touch beaks, and it's uh, like a way of saying, "Okay, I see you are dominant. Uh, it's fine. I, I respect that." So it, this avoids getting into into a fight. Um, and uh, we know that the these dominant uh, birds they 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 have um, privileged access to food through their, their dominance behavior. They manage to, to chase others off feeders. So we put these feeders from, um, we put these feeders, um, sorry, on, on, the, um, on the ground so that we can measure who these, all these dominant interactions. And as you see here, some, some individuals chase others. And, um, uh, so that the, that is a, a dominant individual chasing a subordinate one and then going on to the, the feeder. Um, we also know that females have reduced access to the, the feeders, so they are usually subordinate in relation to, to males. So we, in these feeders, they, they, uh, so they have less access to, to food when it's provided like this. Um, but we also know that this dominance hierarchy can break down in really bad um, years when conditions deteriorate badly. And this is what you see in this fo the photo on, on the bottom. Um, there's either no, too much of, of a cost in, in, in keeping the dominance hierarchies. All the birds are so um, desperate for, for food that everyone feeds together and, um, and we don't see the, the, the clear dominance uh, hierarchy that we see when conditions are, uh, are good. So, so some indication that con conditions do influence um, this type of conflict, although this was the data obtained in a single year uh, and we need to, to continue this and to confirm this trend. But because the females have less access to, to these feeders, uh, we know that they, they pay a cost. So a cost of uh, uh, for females to maintain their dominance hierarchy is more costly. So we measure the physiological cost in females and males. And we see that there is a cost um, for uh, females of maintaining their social status, but we don't find that cost in males. Uh, and we think it's because males have uh, um, more... Um, easier access to resources so it's not uh, they, they, they can feed uh, more easily so it's not as costly for them um, to, to maintain this uh, their physiological condition as it is for females and there's another type of conflict uh, terrible type of conflict in the social weavers uh, which is infanticide this was quite unexpected uh, for us when we we found it but uh, it is um, quite common. And uh, so we are doing, uh, trying to collect more data and doing quite a bit of work to try to understand this, um, why infanticide happens in this species. 
um, one thing we have, uh, so it seems that when the nest is left, if a nest is left unattended, there will be an intruder that, that goes in and, and kicks out the, the chicks. And we are trying to understand why. So we're trying to understand who are these, these birds that do this. And uh, again, if there are environmental conditions that favor this behavior. And we do have indication that yes, that uh, when conditions are uh, bad. So contrary to, to the effect that I was describing above, you know, where in a good year, everyone is feeding, or sorry, in a bad year, everyone is feeding, the, the dominance hierarchy breaks down and everyone has access to the food. Here, it seems to be the opposite. Um, we did this is preliminary results, but it seems that when rainfall is low, the, 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 the broods, which is what this graph shows, um, broods that are produced uh, under uh, conditions of low rainfall, um, they, they will have, um, they will be more, they will suffer more uh, infanticide than when conditions are good. So this suggests that there is a competition for resources and that uh, individuals will try to kill the offspring of others uh, to have more resources for themselves. So, but as I say, this is still, um, work that uh, we are continuing to to get a better understanding of, of what is going on with such a, a terrible uh, behavior so it seems that there are some factors that can influence the balance uh, between cooperation or, or conflict uh, as i say this is work to be continued um, but uh, hopefully in a few years we will get a, a little bit more uh, data and results that will shed light on on this um, on on these two sides of uh, of living in, in societies between cooperation and, and conflict and this brings me to the end of my talk. So I would just like to finish by acknowledging again all my um, collaborators, students, the field assistants, and uh, also the, the funding um, entities that have kept the study going for uh, all these years. And uh, I thank you for listening, for your interest in this topic, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Rita. That that was very interesting. And for me, I you know I'm a biologist, and uh, in my previous life, I was a marine biologist and uh, spent a lot of time looking at fish and uh, studying fish and and uh, including some behavior and feeding and things like that. <clears throat> and it's really interesting to see the the intricate ways in which you get into the lives of the birds and come to understand them. So I think now we can take some questions. Um, and I'll just check yeah. in the chat. If anybody has questions, uh, um, you, can, you can just ask them in the chat. Um, Jackie is asking how the heavy rains affected breeding this year. Oh, that's such an interesting question. So my my whole thinking all the time I've I've been working on sociable weavers was like uh, you know more rain the, the more rain the the happier the the birds will be the better the breeding success will will be, and uh, and this year uh, the, it rained so much I think at some point it was just too much S the grass was uh, in, super tall was incredibly tall uh, dense and uh, moist and I think it's just wrong um, uh, type of habitat for the, the social weavers. So they they stopped breeding quite early on. I mean, the rains have continued. They, the social weavers can, can breed for eight, nine, ten months. I mean, we've had continuous breeding throughout the year. Um, and uh, like I say, I've always put it down, and, and it has been that the the more rains, the for the longer they continue. But uh, this year was just, it seems that it was, really was too much. The birds couldn't forage. They were always on, we were always seeing them on the road, uh, which it's, of, of course, sometimes you do see them on the road, but it's relatively rare. They're usually in the grass and they were always, whenever we went to the field and back, um, we would always be some colonies on the road. So yeah, I just think it really was uh, too much for them, which as I say, was really, really interesting for me. I, I, I spent a bit of time in, in Kimberley this year as well, and uh, it, I mean, the rainfall was off the scale of incredible. Yes. And I, I noticed that, uh, um, that quite a lot of the, the nests were 
kind of looking bedraggled as well. They looked uh, like the grass was rotting, and I mean the the the, the mm. material was rotting, and uh, it just didn't it didn't look <laughs> like they were uh, in good shape. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we actually had uh, uh, a colony that uh, collapsed. Although that, I mean, that is often also because of other reasons. Uh, uh, it could be the bad weather, the, the rain itself, just making it unusually uh, uh, heavy. But um, we we also found that the birds were not building um, as much, and we actually did uh, a little experiment. We just we went to the colony that had uh, collapsed, and we we took some straw that we took to other colonies, and the birds were using the straw that we gave them to build. But uh, it just seems that they didn't have um, they didn't have enough uh, of the, the the good grass that they use for for the nest building because. Uh, yeah maybe because it was too green too long uh, i don't know so yes it it did it did affect them mm. um this is a con uh, a comment from uh, shalesh uh, saying gray cap social weavers in kenya do the same like the sociable weavers in southern africa where the chicks are being fed by helpers yes they do uh the yes cooperative breeding this this uh, helping behavior and cooperative breeding is uh, about uh, nine percent um, of uh, of all bird species do it uh, and it's about uh, 19 or something of the 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 social the monogamous or biparental care species so it's not uh, super unusual uh, the difference with the the these gray capped social weavers uh, is that they don't uh, leave they don't have the communal nest mass so they, they build their own nests and they all end up being aggregated uh, because they just build them very close to each other but they don't have the communal uh, part of the nest like the social weavers do so it's an interesting difference between the two species I'm just curious, and I'm going to inter interject my question here because it's yes. exactly what you were uh, talking about. But what about buffalo weavers? Do they, I mean, they kind of do some, some similar cooperative nest building. Do they have similar behaviors in terms of yes so so you get me on that one because the the buffalo weavers i i don't know them uh, quite as well yes they also have a communal a communal part of the nest yes like the sociable weavers but i don't know how it is um maintained if it is just the parts between their nests because you see with the sociable weavers there's two communal sides to their nests. So you have the, the part, the under part, which is below between the nest chambers. And, uh, and then you have the, the thatch or the, the, the canopy, you know, so, so the, the top of the nest, which is, uh, it's no one's, um, the, the, the part between the chambers, you can think that the, the, the birds that uh, have a, a nest chamber just there is going to build a little bit just because it's part of, the, of its uh, entrance. Uh, but the, they have the communal roof. And I think the buffalo weavers only have the, the communal parts between the, their, their nests. I don't think they have like a, a proper roof. Um, mm, that's no interesting. I, I never thought about it like that, but yeah. Yeah, but actually, I'm saying this, but uh, as I say, that that is, uh, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I don't know enough about buffalo weavers, and I should actually. Mm. Okay, so let's move on. Deborah is asking, what's the lifespan of the individual birds? Yes, the oldest social weaver we've ever caught was 16 years old, which is quite something for a, a pastoring mm. uh, like that. Small bird, and we yes. have... Yeah, so 16, that was exceptional. We have, uh, but we have, then we, uh, yeah, then we have a, uh, one 14 year old, and then we have several 13, 12, 11, 10, that is not uh, super common, but relatively common. Um, Elizabeth is asking, do Southern Pied Babblers also nest cooperatively? Yes, they do. Yes, yeah. They are cooperative breeders as well. So they, they are territorial cooperative breeders, so they defend the territory. Uh, the group will defend the territory. But yes, they also have helpers at the nest, much like the social leaders. Lots of comments about how fascinating it is. Um, oh, thank you. Um, are the nest chambers interconnected inside the huge structure? I think you just answered that, but maybe clarify it. 
Yes, I can clarify. Yeah, that's something people often ask. Uh, so it, yeah, it's a good question as well. They are not. They are individual chambers, individual nest chambers. Um, just uh, no connection in, in there. Like I say, sometimes you, you have a family group uh, that will use two or three chambers, even three, um, so nearby, but they don't connect uh, inside. Okay, there's a bunch of questions from Alejandro in Italy. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to pick them out. Have you looked, found out if there is some kind of relation between these helpers and their age status? age comma status yes um yes i can uh, well i can reply as, as you go uh yes so the um, the helpers are usually young birds so not uh, immature they are uh, they are uh, adults but um uh, between they, they seem to help between one and two year old when they're one and two year old and then they move on to become breeders uh, typically, obviously, I mean, with uh, with some exceptions, but this is typically what they do. And um, yes, yeah, so I see the rest of the question where the helpers are usually young individuals. Uh, answer that. Uh, we also have older ones, yes. So grandparents, it's rare, but we have had grandparents helping, and uh, uncles um, more commonly. Um, and uh, the question about um, whether so just just to answer about the uncles and, and grandparents it's sometimes uh, if the if the individual can't uh, breed or if their breeding fails they sometimes go and, and help um, uh, at uh, at the nest so this this is the case when we've had uh, grandparents and uncles it seems that it was for, for that reason um the the dom whether more dominant individuals are more likely to help to be helped uh we don't we actually looked at that um we found that they they tend to have more helpers but um, we don't know if that is because they manage to coerce others to help them or if it is simply because they are uh, they have higher reproductive success so that is still working in progress <laughs> no definite answer not there and oh yes, and actually I can continue with the same one regarding the temperature. You asked if it was measured inside the nest or outside, and it was ambient temperature. So yeah, me measured in a weather station uh, nearby. Okay, carry on because you're you're obviously reading. You can read the chat. So, <laughs> so yes, but I, I'm just not sure which answers have been. Um, Okay, so the, it or not, so sorry, I don't have. To yeah, that's it. fine. I will pick it up. Um, so, so the the one asked about the lifespan of the bird, but this one's asking about the lifespan of the nest. How long does the nest last? So uh, I, I can't tell you for sure, but there are uh, there seem to be records of of nests that are about uh, hundred years old. Uh, like family accounts of this nest that was already there and it's still there. Um, I know that in, in our study site, there are nests that uh, are there, have been there since uh, 1993. Uh, when So the, the study was actually initiated by Mark Anderson, who's now the CEO of BirdLife South Africa, when he was a, an ornithologist with the uh, Northern Cape Nature Conservation. And so in 93, he started taking people out to, the, to Benfontein to catch some colonies and, and just bring the birds. And um, some of the nests that Mark um, uh, used in 93 are still are still there, still going strong. So um, that is um, quite a long time. Um. <clears throat> Okay, that one was answered. Do you know how the breeding pair is chosen? Uh, you mean mate choice between the male and the female? Well, yeah, we can't know if that is what it is, but if that is what it is, uh, we don't know. So, and that is one thing that we really want to try to understand. Uh, so one of the things we want to understand is whether cooperation plays a role in there or not at all. Or, um, we want to understand whether the, the birds, so the helpers, both females and males help, but the males tend to help for a little longer than the females uh, because the females usually disperse to breed in another colony and the males stay. And uh, so we want to know whether the males that are better helpers, that help more, have a higher chance of being chosen as, um, 
as mates you know, for for the for reproduction but um, so that is one of our big questions but we for the moment we cannot tell at all mm, that, that that's always a very interesting question is about mate choice yeah um, and the role of uh, 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 you know sexual selection by by female choice yes yes one fascinating subject absolutely yeah. uh, and there's you know there's behavior there's uh, signaling and 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 it, it all comes together i guess in, in some yes yes way. yes 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 yeah exactly so we i mean yeah we are interested in understanding whether cooperation can be a signal for a female choice yeah, that, yeah. that's really interesting yes yeah so i think that's a good point to end on and uh uh, thank you so much, Rita, for, for this really uh, awesome presentation. It, it always amazes me to see what kinds of tricks uh, biologists can use to get into the lives of <laughs> organisms they study. And uh, really fascinating. So thanks thank again. Thank you so much. Thank really you so much. It. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be able to talk to a, a, you know, a more general audience and not just the, the scientific, uh, all the scientists that usually are the audience of my talk. So that uh, was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. And for the people that are still here, um, we do have another, and you know, we are, I haven't said this often, but uh, we are celebrating women in birding and ornithology this month. And we do have uh, Susie Cunningham finishing up at the end of the month next week, Thursday. And uh, she's got some really interesting stories to tell as well. And if you're interested in how people get into the lives of birds, how scientists get into the lives of birds, you don't want to miss Susie. Same time next week, Thursday. So thanks again. And thanks, Rita. And good night, thanks. everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, whatever time of day it is where you are. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.